So I'm here at the Hamburg Film Festival, and with me today is Ruben Osland. Um, in your film, The Square, which uh, premieres tomorrow night here, uh, this t uh, tonight, actually, um, you take a deeper look at our society and the things we, on how the things we do differ from the things we believe in, or we actually believe. What was the spark that first brought you to this topic? Uh, actually, it started out that me and a friend of mine made this um, art installation, The Square, and uh, <clears throat> that idea came from when I was doing a feature film called Play. Um, and play was about a group of young boys that was robbing other young boys in the center of the city in, in Gothenburg. It was inspired of true events. And uh, I read through the court files of the event, these events. And <clears throat> even though these robberies, uh, they took place in many, many, many times, even if these robberies were taking place in a mall in the center of the city where there were a lot of adults around, it was very seldom that any adult interacted and tried to stop the robberies. Uh, so it was almost like the kids' world and the adults' world were taking place on two parallel levels. And I was talking to my father about this and he told me that when he was brought up in the 50s in Stockholm, he was six years old when he was brought up in the 50s in Stockholm, uh, when he should go out and play, his parents put an advertisement around his neck and send him out uh, in the center of Stockholm to play all alone. And if I compare that, uh, that with, with today, it's almost like there have been an attitude change in society. You know, back then you looked at other adults as someone that would help your children. And today we almost look at other adults as someone that was threatening our children. So I think this pointed out something about that these robberies in Gothenburg could take place without any adults who were interacting. So in this context we decided, me and a friend of mine, that we wanted to create a symbolic place that are changing the social contract in, in, in the public spaces. So it was like a white mark square, a three times three meter, and within this uh, space we should make an agreement that if someone is going and standing there, it's uh, uh, because you want to be seen and maybe you want to ask for help. And then it's my obligation to address this person and ask, how, why are you standing in the square? How can I help you? So that was the starting point. Mm -hmm. um, you address a lot of issues we have in our society nowadays, so social or family problems, and you even comment on the contemporary art. Um, you seem to realize that there's not just this one problem, but um, a combination of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult was it to get all these parts into one film? It was kind of difficult. I mean, the reason that it takes place in the contemporary art world was because we were uh, invited to exhibit our art piece in a contemporary art museum in Sweden. And then I, I had the idea that I wanted to make a film about the square or the thematic that the square is uh, arising. Uh, but I didn't understand how I should make the film. But when we were invited to this art museum, then I thought maybe we, we can let the film take place in an art museum. And that I can use this period when I'm doing the exhibition here as a research period for the film. Um, so, and then I was thinking maybe the main character in the film should be the chief curator of this museum. You know, someone that is representing the thoughts, these humanistic thoughts uh, that the square is, uh, is about and that he has an exhibition with this idea, but he's challenged at the same time on a personal level. So I, I love to look, it, look, like, uh, look on the film that it takes place in two parallel levels, so to speak, that <clears throat> one of them is his personal life and he's trying to deal with his moral issues. Uh, with a very simple plot line actually with him, he's getting robbed on his cell phone. And the other part is the thing that is going on in the museum, uh, and about this exhibition and the PR agency that is trying to promote uh, the art installation in the square. Mm. So then I just put in different kind of scenes that I think has to do with the thematic. I, I always collect scenes, you know, that I think to have to do with the thematic, and then I I'm try to understand if I can put it into into the storyline, so to speak, of, of the film. Yeah. Um, one of the things you're referring to is the so-called bystander effect, mm -hmm. um, which uh, says that in an emergency concealed in a uh, anonymity uh, of a group of onlookers, the bystander will feel less obligated to intervene. Uh, what's the reason you, we've been attracted to that effect? 
I think also the situation with the points that got robbed that I made in play was obvious that bystander effect was a part of why this could happen. And I think that if you look at sociology, it's a very interesting way to approach human being. You don't put guilt on the individual. You actually try to tell us, look what human beings tend to do when we are in this setup. So it's a way of understanding us in a behavioristic point of view. And the bystander effect is, is a sociologic term and um, I, I have been approaching many, uh, many of the contents in my movies with that kind of uh, approach. Um, and the bystander effect, I think, is there's many scenes that is about this in the film. You know, um, one of them is the monkey imitator scene, where uh, everybody is getting suddenly witness to someone that is like harassing this woman, uh, dressed in a tuxedo, sitting there, and the reason that they are not doing anything is that they are scared. Uh, and this is also part of the uh, bystander effect. The reason that we are paralyzed when we see something, we don't know what we, what to do, is also that we feel, don't take me, don't take me, take someone else, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 my only answer can be that I, I love the behavioristic approach that, that um, I think it's a good way of approaching the thematic in the films. Yeah, no, I, I personally love that in your films. So, right. um, have you had, ever had some kind of fear that the people people might not get what you're trying to say? Well, I mean, I I don't have a, like a super clear message. I can talk about each and every single scene quite much. I can talk about like a tendency that I think I see in contemporary time. I can talk about like an attitude change that I think that we should try to be aware of. Uh, and this is not like a single simple message in that really. Um, and what I think that I'm trying to do when I'm doing my films is to provoke questions and to set up scenes that the audience actually uh, have to talk about after they have left the cinema. I love when I heard people that are, we were talking for hours about the film. Yeah, exactly. Just activate the audience. Absolutely. So exactly. for me, I mean the audience is not stupid, you know. So it's very, very strange sometimes when you can feel that uh, some movies have like a very, very a message that is like on a child's level. You know, we should be nice to each other or whatever. Mm. When then not see, showing the complexity of existence. So I, I believe that the audience is uh, very smart, and and also that I believe the kids are smart enough to see the film. But we we have to also look at cinema culture that it it can be intellectually challenging sometimes. Absolutely. Um, the film takes its time with its uh, 142 minutes, mm. and, but I think it's not one minute too long. Have, has there ever, ever been someone in the, trying to convince you to, to cut it down? And uh, yes, I think the, the sales agent that is uh, selling the film to the distributors, they are always afraid of, I would say, every, any length that is over two hours. Um, what did you respond to them? I, I think he have an understanding also that I'm, I would protect the, my intention with the film and, and uh, that I also think that the, if you make a film too short and it's not made to be that short, then you actually can make the film really, really bad. Um, he's aware of this. Um, I can, but I can say also that I respect their problem, you know, you have a certain kind of time slots on an evening on a cinema and if the film is two hours then you can sh screen it more more than two times maybe uh, <clears throat> so and at the same time i must say that if you have like harry potter or james bond or these movies that quite often are two over two hours and 30 minutes i mean that kind of entertainment we have no problem at all looking at but as soon as it comes like to, to a topic where we want to discuss maybe something that is important in our society we want to have it over with quicker <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I read that you've been shooting for 70 days, mm -hmm. um, which I think is double the average of, of a film in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, that must have given you a lot of freedom. Yes, yeah? a lot of freedom. I, for me it has been interesting and important, and I have been working like this with all my films. That is, you know, as soon as you put up the camera and the actors are there and everything is in place, you will meet challenges that you couldn't expect. 
So when you're trying to transform this script that is a paper product into a visual product, you are going to meet challenges that is hard to understand how you should solve them. So therefore time on set is very important for me. And it's also important because in the beginning of the day, then the actors can take some risks when they are uh, trying out the scene. They can do things that actually feels a little silly. Sometimes those silly things are the most uh, uh, best genius uh, things that you can keep to, to have in the movie. But if they only have five takes, then they will never be able to take those risks. So in the beginning of the day, I'm trying out the scene. Then I'm repeating it over and over and over again and doing take after take. And then in the end of the day, I go five takes left. Are everybody ready? Now really try to push in some energy and I'm, I'm trying to convince everybody this is an important football game going on. Uh, and then I do a countdown. Four takes left. Come on, there's three takes left. Uh, and very often I'm using the, the second last uh, take. Not the last one, but the second last one is very often the one that is the best one. Okay, so, so it would have been a totally different film if you had, let's say, half of the days? I don't know. I mean, then I probably, if I only had half of the days, then I would probably have half of the scenes. So the first edited version of this film was uh, three hours and 42 minutes. So uh, I think my producer maybe think that I can have half of the <laughs> half, half size of the scenes. <laughs> uh, when you're shooting, do you strictly follow your script or do you improvise or change the script during the shooting? It's dependent on which scene it is. Sometimes it's the setup of the scene that is the interesting. Sometimes it's the dialogue that is the interesting. But I always give the actors a certain kind of freedom to investigate how they should deal with the scene. And very often they come up with something that is much better than I could uh, fantasize and write about. So um, you have to use the ability and the skill of the actors uh, when you're trying out what you're going to shoot. Because otherwise you are not using the process of filmmaking in the right way. You know, If you only have a script and we're only covering up the script, then there are some possibilities that are left out that might be quite interesting. Hmm. Um, there's actually more than one real installation of the square, as you mentioned mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, how did it come to this? And most importantly, which one was first, the, the installation or your film? The first thing was the installation. Ah. And I'm almost considering the feature film as an advertising film for the installation. Because I really think that the installation, uh, the square itself, is a great idea. And it exists now in two cities in, in, in Sweden and two cities in, Nor in Norway. And the first city in Sweden was Värnamo. Uh, they built it in 2015. And um, it had become a small movement in Värnamo. You know, people are using it in all kind of different ways. Um, there have been a, a group of functionally handicapped that lost the benefit from the state. They went there and had a demonstration. And then um, uh, the local newspaper came and took a picture of them and reported about them. And when it was these terror events, and there was also a high school murder, and they had manifestations against violence. So they, they actually have used this place in Manamo. Oh, good to hear. Um, in one scene in the apartment of uh, Elizabeth Moss, you see an ape. Yeah. Uh, um, he doesn't deliver an explanation, or at least I, I didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. um, what was the reason for that? Uh, or was there a reason for that? I, uh, it was no, never, yeah, but there's a, the, I would say it was more of a, a dramaturgy reason. Or, but I mean, an ape, if you look at what, what the ape represents in art, it's very often used to reflect that human being is an animal. So it becomes uh, um, like someone that you use, like we have a primal side of uh, instincts and needs and uh, we shouldn't forget about this. And they, I think that the monkey have been used like in literature and in, in painting and like that quite often like a symbol for that. Um, and I think that the, the monkey is interesting in that way because we are mirroring ourselves in the monkey um, uh, because the monkey is not ashamed of their instinct and needs. So it's kind of interesting to look uh, at monkeys because of this. But in the film, you know, I think the, the scene comes in after like one hour or something in the film. 
And I love the idea of breaking the contract with the audience. You know, the audience think that they know, ah, it's a film that takes place in an art museum and this is basically what we are going to experience. But suddenly comes into a chimpanzee, into an apartment, and anything can happen in a movie, like if that had happened, you know? What can you expect? What will happen later on in that movie? That is kind of interesting. Okay, yeah. Uh, talking about expectations, you won the Palme d'Or in Cannes with mm. this film, and uh, tonight it's being shown as the German premiere here at the Film Fest Hamburg, yeah. the, and also the closing night film. Um, what are you expecting from tonight's screening? Uh, I first of all, I I'm going to do a little sociological experiment with them. Oh, uh, I'm going to bring my cell phone and my wallet. And in order to show that I trust the audience of Hamburg, I'm going to put the cell phone and the wallet in the cinema uh, when I'm leaving them and coming back two and a half uh, hour later. So uh, <laughs> that's the first thing that I'm going to do. And then and I hope that I will have a nice Q&A afterwards. We're going to have a Q&A. And then I'm going to bring the golden palm, actually. And I will invite the audience to take selfies uh, together with the golden palm. That's a lovely idea. Yeah. I love that. Um, what are your next projects? Is there anything you can already talk about? Mm -hmm. I'm making a feature film that is called The Triangle of Sadness. And uh, Triangle of Sadness is when you have a wrinkle in between your eyebrows because you have had a lot of trouble in your life. But don't worry, you can fix that in 15 minutes with Botox. <laughs> And the film is taking place in fashion industry and beauty industry because my wife, she's a fashion photographer. Uh, so she has been telling me quite many stories about, about that world. Uh, and I'm going to like, look at beauty as an economical currency. You know, it actually, you can be born without money, education or talent. But beauty can make you travel in, in the hierarchy of the society. So I will... Um, Try to attack that in just as uh, in uh, just as satirical way as I did with uh, with the square. Oh, well, I'd love to see that. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the interview. Thank you. And good luck with the film. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.